Hey everyone, my name is Melanie Grant, and this is just a video going over the evaluation and management coding for office and other outpatient services in the 2021 with the new guidelines on how to code for outpatient visits or your basic office visit to your normal family practice provider and other specialty types. So let's take a look together at some of the new guidelines and how we use them to select medical decision making for these special types of ENM visits. You can see here that I'm sharing my screen and I'm going to be using the ICE, the CPT coding guidelines from 3M's coding resources to show you exactly what we're looking at as we're looking at ENM selections. So I'm already logged into my 3M product. And I'm going to go to my coding resources here to look at my online version of the CPT book. Now I'm ready to look at some of those guidelines with you. If you watch some of my other videos this week, you've seen me look at some of the evaluation and management services guidelines specifically for 99202 through 99499 at the guidelines that pertain to services other than office and other outpatient. So now we want to look at specific to other and office outpatient. When I click on this section, it takes me directly to the coding. And there's a few things you want to take note of. Number one, there's codes for 99202, 99203, 99204, and 99205 for a new patient, which requires medically appropriate history and or exam and a straightforward medical decision making. This is a little bit different from most of our regular e &M services, which require key components of history exam and medical decision making. For office and outpatient services in the 2021 guidelines, instead of looking at all three components, we just look at medical decision making or time to select our time for the visit. We'll go over time in another training video where we talk about time as an element for either selecting your office and other outpatient service or as a key component that overrides other key components for other types of services. I want to start by looking at more information to see what's available on ENMs. I can see here that there's several different details listed in the evaluation and management legend. I can look at some of my coding tips, which are going to go into specifics about professional based services. You want to remember when we talk about office or outpatient services, this is just the professional service for the provider when outpatient, just as the professional service for the provider when inpatient also has an ENM code. This is different from inpatient facility billing, which bills for the hospital itself. I can see guidelines here for new, verse, new information that tells me about um, 99201 being deleted. So if you're familiar with office visits, you'll see that the 99201 is no longer a code for office and other outpatient services. And my favorite is the table. Now I love the ENM tables because they really give us a clear definition of how to select our visit. Here we can see any level of history or exam as appropriate can be documented. So it doesn't matter what the provider says, so long as there's something in there about the patient and the reason they're here for the visit. Medical decision making, however, is the key driver for this visit. And it's an either or situation, meaning we're going to bill our visit based off of the level of medical decision making or the time for the visit. So, I'm going to take a quick screenshot of this and show you how I would use a screenshot on my computer or a printed version if I had it in a plastic sleeve to select this office visit. So give me one second to get that prepped for you. So this is just a screenshot that I've selected with my Mac. You can take a screenshot with your Windows based computer as well. And if it doesn't give you the option to mark up on your screenshot, you can utilize paint, which is usually available on any version of most Windows based computers. And so now what I can do is I can mark 
the level of history or exam as any level or history or exam because it doesn't matter. So let's say that I have a patient that has a moderate medical decision making. I'm going to come here and see that this falls under a 99204 when looking at a new patient. Let's say that that same patient is documented with approximately 50 minutes of their visit. When 50 minutes of the visit falls within the time frame between 45 and 59, that also meets the same documentation requirements for a level four or a 99204. And so despite which way I decide to code, both of these would be coded at the highest level of specificity at a 99204. Now, come on, that seems a little too easy. And maybe it is, but there's a few other steps we can take when looking at the other and office outpatient services. Our real meat and potatoes is going to be in how we select that medical decision-making level. Let's look now at the other table for established patients. Our next, our next set of codes, 99211 through 99215, all have details indicating for an established patient. In a 99211, the presenting problems are minimal. And you'll notice there's no requirements for history exam or medical decision making. In fact, this code is used by your nurses when a physician has indicated that the patient should come in for something simple, such as a blood pressure check where a chargeable service is not available. 99212 through 99215 are your provider services and will include information such as straightforward medical decision making with a medically appropriate history or exam or time of 10 to 19 minutes. Your 213 subsequently has a low level of medical decision making with specified time. 214 or level four is moderate with specified time. And 215 or level five is a high level medical decision making with a specified number of time. Now, when we look at the table for evaluation and management services for established patients, other and office and other outpatient services, we can see a lot of the same information. And so here we see medically appropriate history and or exam is not necessary. Medical decision making for 99211 has no requirements, but for levels two through five, these are the same levels we saw on the new patient for straightforward level two, the difference is that one versus a zero. Low level three or 99213, a moderate like the one we selected before for a level four or 99214, and a high medical decision-making as a level five or 99215. So you can see the biggest difference between the codes is actually the one or the zero, unless you're coding by time. On the timetable though, we have completely different times. So if you're coding for the highest specificity and your patient was seen for 55 minutes, instead of being a moderate level of service, which would be a level four, 99214 that we saw earlier, a patient with documented 55 minutes of time would be instead be a 99215 and might even qualify for prolonged services depending on how far beyond 55 minutes they go. So that's really just a brief overview on how we use the 99202 through 99215 codes to select the level of service. We haven't really gone into medical decision making yet, but when we do, you'll notice some really big changes between medical decision-making from office and other outpatient services and the, re the rest of our ENM coding. Let's take a look at that now. I'm gonna go ahead and step out for a minute of our section that we were in. And instead of looking at office and other outpatient services, I wanna direct my attention to the evaluation and management service guidelines looking specifically at the other and outpatient services because we have some definitions and differences found in the overview. 
Here we can see guidelines for other office and other outpatient services or ENMs. And it's going to go over the very specific details that are necessary in my visit. History and your exam are identified in the guidelines as only being a, as provider medically, provider indicated medically appropriate. Say that five times fast. Basically saying when the provider performs it, the provider knows if it's medically appropriate and we're not going to direct him or her or them as to what is appropriate. We'll take their word that they've collected all of the detail necessary for this patient. Instead, we'll look at the amount of documentation they provide on the actual medical decision making based off of different details, like the amount of diagnoses that are being addressed, the amount and complexity of data that they're reviewing or ordering, how much additional services they need to provide, and at the end of the day, how much risk applies to the patient. In other words, how, how much of what we do today could potentially cause harm to the patient. So we see here, this is broken down in the guidelines for number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter. There's definitions of these elements here. So they say, what is a problem? What is a problem addressed? And this is really important when you're trying to determine different levels of information. I'll show you in a moment how we directly correlate this with the AMA's score scorecard that is now taking place of the previous Novitas scorecard we've used in the past. Definitions tell us what a minimum problem versus a self-limited or minor problem is, stable and chronic versus acute that's uncomplicated or later on acute with illness with systemic conditions or complicated illnesses and injuries. We can go through all of these. I won't take all of your time because you can read through these just as easily as I can for you. But the important thing is to ask questions. It's important to know when there's a question that doesn't make sense because areas of gray always arise. Documentation for testing is counted for each single test that the provider either orders or reviews during the encounter. And when we count how many tests they reviewed or ordered, we'll count each one independently. Same thing when we look at external records or when the provider is talking to external providers that may have taken care of the patient in the past or may have looked at other charts of theirs in order to really get a full history of what's going on with their patient. This can happen in the hospital setting as well as in the outpatient setting. Independent historian is talking about um, when a patient is coming in with somebody other than themselves, that's giving us information about why they're here. Think of it like this. If you have a three-year-old and you're there with your three-year-old, most likely that three-year-old's not giving the doctor the details of why they're being seen. In the same note, a lot of husband and wife duos will give information about the other partner, as well as parents that are aging who may have their adult children with them or even friends. You also have independent interpretation, which is credit for the provider when they look at say an X-ray or an EKG result, where they're looking at the specific tracing or the image itself and interpreting it, but not getting paid for it. This is meant to give them credit for the additional work that it takes for them to look at it and the time that they put into that. Finally, your level of risk is probably one of your biggest ones. And it looks at really, again, how risky is the treatment that we're giving for the patient, such as probability of death or morbidity, um, loss of limb, and other serious uh, determinants. Anything that falls under a high level of risk should be documented specifically by the provider. And when we get to this table here, we can put it all together. Now. Many of you have probably already watched the medical decision-making video that I've put up this week that talks about selecting the level of medical decision-making based off of the 1995 or 1997 guidelines. Many of those same things apply, but they're broken differently here. So try to put out of your mind what the 95 and 97 guidelines state 
and instead look at office and outpatient, other outpatient services as the following table. A level one requires no detail for number of problems addressed, amount of complexity reviewed or ordered, or even risk to the patient. It's simply an office code that's listed when the patient is seen. It should not be used by the provider. The provider themselves should have some level of detail that identifies an e &M. Instead, a level one visit should just be used by nurses. A level two is called straightforward. And this is based on two out of three elements in the MDM meaning that whatever the highest level the patient gets for two of these three columns here is the highest level we code for medical decision making. And you can see here where it goes all the way up to five. Now, I personally find this particular table a little hmm, endearing. So I'm gonna go over to the AMA's website, 2021 medical decision making table. You can just search it on Google and it will pull right up. This one is a lot better. It's all categorized onto one page and you can print it out or you can put it into a PDF document. I like to bring it into PDF because I can write directly on my PDF But if you like to print it, you can also pull it directly into, you can put it directly into a clear plastic sleeve and highlight different information on it. So let's find that document that I just downloaded. There we go. I have it now in my PDF. And I wanted to do that because I can use the highlighter on my PDF version. Many of you may have access to this as well from Adobe Reader, but if you don't, that's okay. There's different ways you can look at this information. Now here, I can really get into the meat and potatoes. And I can say first, the number and complexity of problems addressed. Remember that I have all those terms that I showed you a moment ago? This is where they're going to apply, where you're going to identify the different types of problems found within your encounter to say how many problems and what was the worst type of problem or the most problems that we addressed in our visit. Keep in mind the differences between problems versus problems addressed. A provider addresses problems that the patient presents with, meaning that they are considering those problems for treatment, regardless of whether or not treatment was determined. They may also be addressing those problems as different conditions where they need to evaluate in order to determine the correct method of treatment for a different problem that they're seeing today. Think, for example, of a diabetic patient who is being seen for their hypertension. Certain medications may, may affect their sugars or even their hypertension. And so we have to evaluate both of those in order to treat them for either of the conditions. They may be in the visit specifically for diabetes or specifically for hypertension, or perhaps they're even coming in for pain. And because of their pain management, the provider has to evaluate whether or not it's appropriate to give them certain drugs. This would be problems addressed because each of those is being separately reviewed. In that particular example, diabetes and hypertension are both considered chronic illnesses. And I would address how many of them are being addressed and whether or not they were documented as stable or possibly complicated with exacerbation progression or even with side effects to treatment. If they were in fact diagnosed as stable and not having any problems, I would list for diabetes and hypertension here under moderate medical decision-making for two or more stable chronic illnesses. Let's say the patient was being seen for pain, which was needing uh, pain medications, maybe migraines or headaches, and may be documented as acute uncomplicated. So I can highlight both of those, but I'm gonna go with the highest of this column at the end of the day. So I have a diabetic patient with hypertension, both stable, who's being treated for pain. And because all three of those are addressed, 
I list all three of them and I identify the numbers of complexity or problems addressed as the highest level of service documented. Then I'm ready to move on. Remember that I said the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed or analyzed. This is looking at how much detail the provider has to look at in order to uh, treat the patient or make decisions. So we have each unique test, each unique order, or each unique document will contribute to a combination of two or three for category one. Now you may be reading that and going, wait, what? I know I certainly did the first time I read this. So let's do it together. Here, you have under each level of medical decision-making different criteria that must be met for this level. And in some cases, there's multiple options of criteria. The one we wanna look at first is category one. Category one looks at tests and documents and each unique test order or document will contribute to the combination of two in this category or three when it requires three. In other words, each unique test and order or document reviewed counts as one of category one. So when they say a combination of two of the following, the provider can review prior external notes from each unique source. So if the patient is coming in new and has not seen this provider before, we have notes from their previous family practice provider and we have notes from an ER visit that they may have gone to, and maybe we have notes from another specialist, that would be a total of three because we would count each of those sources, each of those different offices as one unique source. Now, if we review multiple results for test, laboratory test, EKGs, um, and even medicine series type tests like spirometries, which have results recorded, would each be their own unique test. And depending on how many of the patient had previously had done that the provider reviews, each one will be counted as one for category one. Likewise, if the provider orders a test, and again, any kind of test, whether it's lab test, radiology test, or medicine testing, each one of those tests that the provider determines to order is going to be counted as a, uh, one of the points for this category. So you can see how it's very easy to meet a category one with most visits. In fact, our hypertension patient who was also diabetic and came in for pain management probably had to have a blood glucose at the visit to make sure that their blood wasn't um, going haywire as far as their blood sugars went. And if they had an A1C recently, the provider probably reviewed that to make sure that they haven't had any complications over the past so much time. So that would count as two unique tests just for those two things alone. Now you'll notice the terminology of limited or uh, limited, which uh, is identified as category one or category two. For category one under limited, we only require two of these three bullet points. But if these don't apply, we can look at category two and determine if this applies. Category two looks at the assessment requiring an independent historian. And it says for the categories of independent interpretation of tests and discussion of management or test interpretation, see moderate or high. In other words, remember our terminology. We may have to go back a couple of times and see what these words mean according to the guidelines for CPT e &Ms. We have here an independent historian, which as I mentioned earlier, is the individual that is with the patient and providing history about the patient. So if the provider is seeing a pediatric patient and documents that the patient is being seen with their mom who has provided all the history, we've just identified category two for our medical decision-making for under amounts of data and complexity. Not to say it's a high level, because it's not, but it's definitely important to identify as we're going through, because these things can drive a higher level of visit. Now, keep in mind the differences between a level three and a level four 
aren't paid differently. They're simply tracked for certain data statistical information and making sure we have the correct amount of resources available for the services we provide. So that's it for data and complexity on a limited level, which falls under a low level of medical decision making. Remember that I mentioned the patient who was seen for diabetes, hypertension, and pain had a blood glucose and an A1C. And so it would look more like this. I would have a limited based off of category one because there was two of the following. There was review of multiple tests and possible order of additional tests. I didn't say there was any order, so it wasn't documented. Therefore, it did not happen. But I did say category one, we had review of a glucose finger stick, which is actually going to include an order, by the way, because it's done in office or POCT. And we also have the review of the results of a previous test, which is the A1C. Now let's continue looking at this because the data area is probably the most complicated out of the whole medical decision-making chart. So once you've determined that, okay, yes, I've met for category number one here because we reviewed and ordered the glucose finger stick and we reviewed over the A1C test, therefore we've met category one for a limited level of service. However, what else might that same information meet on the next level of data? So for a moderate level of data under your medical decision-making chart, it must meet the requirements of one out of three categories. So we have category one here again, test documents and independent historians. You'll notice that those have blended now from the previous category two. And instead of just two items, it requires three from this following list of four bullet points. Now these are very similar to what we've already looked at. Review of prior external notes, from a previous provider or each unique source, review of results for each unique test, which we know we have two of, ordering of each unique test, which we know we have one of, and assessment requiring independent historian. So if I was looking at this, I would say, okay, well, I still meet category one for a moderate level of data on the medical decision-making chart but I also need category two or three, or actually, no, I don't need category two or three. It only requires one of these three categories to be met. The next level would require two of these three. So let's continue looking and see if there's anything else because we should always read up and down. Category two of the elements of medical decision-making looks at independent interpretation of the test. So earlier where I said that sometimes the provider will look at the x-ray or an EKG image or tracing, if they're looking at those services and they're not getting paid for the interpretation of those services, and they're not just simply reading the report, they're actually interpreting something from the test that was performed, they should get service credit here by giving them results for the time that they spent in looking at those reports. In the case that I gave with our diabetic hypertensive patient being seen for pain, none of those applied. Category three is discussion of management or test interpretation. This is basically where the provider calls the radiologist or the cardiologist or another provider that performed these tests and says, hi, I see that you have this diagnosis listed. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner of this image, can you look at this with me and tell me what your thoughts were when you looked at this? Because I feel differently and this is why. Or perhaps they're just calling to see what the results are. In either case, any discussion of management with those other providers or the discussion of the test interpretation is time that the provider is spending in trying to gather more information for our patient. And they get credit for that time based off of category three here, which makes their visit a level four moderate when additional elements apply. 
Moving on, we look at number five, which is extensive level of data or complexity. I only point it out because it's important to be aware of what you have. This has two of three categories as opposed to one of the three categories. So you'll notice those differences for extensive versus moderate. And you'll notice the combination of three of the following for category one is exactly the same as the combination of three of the following for category one when looked at moderate. And so if you meet category one in any of these areas, it's likely that you will probably meet it in other areas as well. So I can come down here and say, yes, I did have review of results for each unique test, which I had two of. And I had the ordering of the blood glucose, which was done POCT or in the office. And therefore there was three combined for category one, which meets for an extensive moderate or limited exam. But because this requires two out of three in order to meet for the extensive, I would also have to have the independent interpretation of tests not separately payable by my provider or the discussion of management of test results. If I did not have one of these two in addition to category one, I would not meet the requirements for an extensive medical decision-making level for elements of amount of complexity. And that's okay. So I can say the highest level I actually have documented is a moderate level of complexity here. And I can see that through my highlights there. Off the bat, remember that the level of medical decision-making is two out of three of these three categories, which means that if I have a moderate number of problems addressed and a moderate level of, of complexity and data, then I have a moderate medical decision-making at the very least. And since I don't have a higher one of these two, I could stop here and say without, without needing to go on that the highest I would be able to code for this visit is a level four, depending on if they're new or established, would be 204 or 214. But we should always be thorough. And so I would wanna continue by looking at the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. Now this category or column, if you will, goes into how high of risk is treating the patient today affect the patient based off of how they presented today in the documentation. Again, it's important to come over here and look at some of your definitions, because when we're looking at this, we're not looking at risk to the patient based off of their conditions, like a patient with cancer who is at a risk of death or morbidity. We're instead looking at the risk of further treatment, further testing, and any additional services that we may be providing that would affect their care today, and what kinds of risk we put them at. This is broken down into different categories here in our guidelines, which are found in the beginning of your CPT book, as well as in the 3M. On my AMA table, I can look at the risk of morbidity or mortality for a level two is minimal, and it just simply says minimal risk. Likewise, low risk is identified simply as low risk. And so if the provider uses this terminology, this is where you would wanna select the level because that is the best way to identify the patient is by following the provider's guidance. If however, we're looking at a moderate level of risk, we're looking at things like prescription drug management, um, decisions for minor surgeries or procedures. And keep in mind, minor surgeries or procedures can include something as small as a skin lesion removal that can be done in the office, even with cryotherapy. Decisions for elective major surgeries that don't have identified patient or procedure risk factors. Now, every single procedure has a level of risk factors. Identified risk factors mean something other than the typical risk of infection or bleeding. 
such as risk to the patient themselves because they're diabetic and diabetic patients are at risk for complications due to the fact that their blood sugars can be affected by surgeries, even small ones. Also under moderate examples, things like diagnoses or treatments significantly limited by social determinants of health. In other words, if they have a lot of things that are preventing them from being able to follow along with the treatment plan or suggested guidelines for how to help them, then this would make the level of risk to the patient higher. And so it does put on a level of care that the provider then has to work around and typically will spend a lot of time trying to find ways to help them get the care that they need. And for that, it does drive, in a small way, the level of risk to a higher level. Now, the last one, again, when we look at high risk of morbidity and mortality um, or any high risk of medical decision making, you want doctors to be very, very specific on what makes it a high level of risk. The examples like drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring for toxicity I've seen doctors document something as simple as saying, I have to monitor the patient's insulin regularly for toxicity because they have a lot of complications and absorption differences. We haven't quite figured out how to get, what level to get their medication at. More likely though, this is talking about specific types of drugs like warfarin that has to be monitored regularly where the provider has to readjust their calculations and the dosage that they're receiving, because if they don't adjust it each day, that patient could be at a high risk for bleeding out because warfarin is an anticoagulant that makes their blood stop coagulating. Other things like decisions regarding elective major surgeries uh, with identified patient or procedure risk factors so if they make decisions for a major surgery based off of something identified for them. Um, again, those risk factors are things that are identified to them directly, not just the fact that it's a procedure. Decisions regarding emergency majory surgery. Majory, major surgery. Decisions regarding hospitalization and one of the most commonly known ones is the decision not to re resuscitate or to the decision to de-escalate care due to a poor prognosis. In other words, if the patient is not feeling that like the prognosis they have is going to benefit them and they decide to stop or lower the amount of care they get, then that would put them at a high risk. And we would wanna calculate that because it does take more time from the provider to make sure to coordinate everything that's needed for their quality of care. At the end of the day, we have our diabetic patient that I mentioned earlier. They're seen for pain management where they wanna get some sort of treatment such as a prescription or maybe even an injection, which would qualify as a minor surgery. But because of their diabetes and hypertension, they have a few risks. And so we had to look at some of those. We had a moderate level of problems addressed based off of the fact that there were two or more stable chronic illnesses, in addition to the acute uncomplicated illness of having a ongoing migraine or headache, needing pain management. They met a moderate level of complexity or data based off of the category one, which meant either three items from the bullet points for a moderate level of complexity of data, as well as category one under limited for two items of the bullet points for amount of complexity or data. We also have a moderate risk of morbidity and mortality based off of the decision for prescription drug management and or an injection to help them with that migraine. And at the end of this day, we're at a level four for 99204 or a 99214 for our new or established patient. Now, that seems like a lot to take in. So I'm gonna make a separate video where we go through some processing to look at these a little bit more in detail 
um, as processing with examples. So feel free to join me on our next deep video as we look at some of those processing examples or feel free to move on and look at medical decision-making when addressed for other types of services and evaluation and management, which we covered this module. Thank you for coming and have a great day.